Welcome. We're so glad you decided to join us here on A Look Ahead. We're doing a series of lessons, as you probably know, on Galatians. These are Sabbath school lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist World Headquarters. And this lesson is number nine. It's intended for study on November 26 of 2011. It's entitled, Paul's Pastoral Appeal. And before we jump into the lesson, I'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin. Our kind and loving Father, as we move deeper into the personal, emotional appeals that Paul made to his friends in Galatia, may we feel also ourselves the, the invitation to come to you, to set aside our worldly distractions and those who would lead us astray, and focus once again on Jesus Christ, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, in this section, and we, we probably ought to read it, you almost have to read the whole thing to sort of get the picture. It starts with Genesis, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 4, verse 12. And up to verse 20, it's just a couple paragraphs here. I beg you, my brothers and sisters, be like me. I beg you. Notice Paul's approach here. After all, I am like you. You have not done me any wrong. You remember why I preached the gospel to you the first time. It was because I was ill. But even though my physical condition was a great trial to me, you did not despise or reject me. Instead, you received me as you would an angel from heaven. You received me as you would... Christ Jesus, you were so happy. What has happened? I myself can say that you would have taken out your own eyes if you could and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those other people show a deep interest in you, but their intentions are not good. All they want is to separate you from me so that you will have the same interest in them as they have in you. Now it is good to have such a deep interest if the purpose is good. This is true always, and not merely when I am with you. My dear children, once again, just like a mother in childbirth, I feel the same kind of pain for you until Christ's nature is formed in you. How I wish I were with you now so that I could take a different attitude towards you. I am so worried about you. So that's Paul's message in this section, and he, it's, it's a pretty moving appeal. Um, he's, he's sort of moved away from the, the heavy theology, and now he's making a very personal, very pastoral appeal. Um, would you call that an emotional appeal? Yes. Sounds like it doesn't. Think of your own personal experience with Christianity. Are you more attractive, attracted by the carefully thought out, logical, sort of truth-based arguments? Here's, here's a doctrine, and, and you like the way it fits together? or by the, someone appealing to you who obviously loves you and cares about you? Or should Christians use both kinds of appeals? Definitely both kinds to engage your mind and your emotions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So getting back into our context here, what would you say were the emotives behind the Judaizing Christians in Galatia? Now, what were Judaizing Christians again? These were the ones who thought that in order to be a real Christian, you had to be a real Jew first. You had to be circumcised. You had to follow all of the Jewish traditions, and then you could become a Christian. So it was a two-step process. Yeah. So it sounds a little bit legalistic. Hmm. So wh why would they want to do that? Why would people travel around the world of, the, around the world of those days? I mean, they, they went to a lot of effort to travel from wherever, maybe even from Jerusalem, all the way to Galatia, to try to say, no, don't listen to this Paul. You know, listen to us. You need to become a real Jew first. You need to be circumcised. You need to da-da-da-da-da, and on and on. Why would they do that? Well, they didn't want to lose their religion if you had to become their religion first, and then you could move on. Otherwise, aren't they valueless? If you could just become a Christian yeah. without becoming a Jew first? In other words, the Judaism is not necessary anymore. They may have been confused about, uh, I mean, if it wasn't necessary, why in the world did God have them go through that for like mm -hmm. 4,000 years? Why, you know, why all of that stuff? Yeah. 
And if the, some of those things like, like circumcision were a, a mark of the true people, mm -hmm. and Christians are the true people, then shouldn't they be circumcised too? There you go. Do you think they were really concerned about that? I, I don't think they were. I think they were just concerned about their, their identity, that, that it was slipping away, that this new religion was coming up, and they wanted to hold on to the old stuff. A part of, it, part of its culture, too, of the Jewish culture. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm not very knowledgeable or fluent about Jewish folk, but it does seem that this strong Jewish identity and culture even today is, is kind of what holds them together as, as a group of people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, well, you know, it, it, that may have been part of... There's another side to the coin we need to think about. Remember that Paul is going to be beheaded in a few years just because he's a Christian. Now, that, the full force of that movement hasn't gotten going yet, but, but already Christians were very much looked down upon, and you could, your life could be in danger if people even knew that you were a Christian. And here are these people saying, and is it possible that they were saying, well, if you pretend to be a Jew first, then you're okay, because the Jewish religion was official. And then on the side, you can be a and kind Christian. Of, and kind of accepted. Yeah. Except, of course, if you're a Jewish, if you were, a, I mean, if you were a Jew and you were a Christian, you weren't in real good with the Jews. But you know, Paul wasn't arguing that way. If mm -hmm. they, they were actually coming up with a plan to make it more safe, Paul would recognize that and say, that's, that's great, but you know, you're, you're getting off the, pro the, the reservation here. Mm -hmm. you know? But he didn't bring that up at all. They were, they were going after something else. OK, what was it? That's what I asked you. <laughs> well. Um, People always, people throughout ages have felt very deeply about their religion. Wars have been fought. For, Many. For centuries. The same war for centuries even. Um, but I don't understand why these, I, I really don't understand why these Judaizers wanted to do this. I think it had to do a lot with the fact that it was works based, possibly. Mm -hmm and that they had a hard time distinguishing between the ceremonial law and the royal law. Let me, see if I, let me see if I can understand. You're saying that they believed that their salvation was at least partly a result of their being circumcised and they're practicing all these Jewish things. And if, if they left Paul alone and he was convincing people that all that stuff was not necessary, mm -hmm. then their religion sort of What's the value of it anymore, right? It was dwindling what, away. Yeah. yeah. What, what was the value of it for the last four thousand years? Yeah. Um, but aside of that, aside of the culture, aside of those rationalizations, it all goes back to this human tendency to want to be able to do things to save us. I think. Yeah. By 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 by, by get you, somehow we just get circumcised and so I, I qualify. Mm. Now the Judaizers, number one, were they Christians? And number two, did they believe Jesus was the Messiah? Yeah, these were Christians. So they believed all that stuff. They just thought you should be fully a Jew first before you became a Christian. They weren't so sure that it was safe to worship with Gentiles in the Christian church. When did these uh, when did these Judaizers quotes become converted? Hmm. Was this was this were these new converts? So Jesus is dead and gone now for about twenty years, and these are the new converts, the new Christians that didn't know Jesus, but are are now you know they're the new ones and and um, because they don't seem to have accepted Jesus' message. Well, here's a, here's a clue. I'm not saying this is the final answer, but this might be a clue. Look at Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 15. It says here, some men came from Judea to Antioch. Now this is the time when Paul, is, is Paul and Barnabas are preaching and, wor and working in Antioch. 
and started teaching the believers, you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised as the law of Moses requires. Does that sound a little bit like Judaizers? Yes. It certainly does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this. So it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this matter. They were sent on their way by the church, and as they went through Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported how the Gentiles had turned to God, because they, they had recently come back from their first missionary journey. This news brought great joy to all believers. Give me another couple of verses. Yeah. Or do you want to? Well, I was just, who were they going back to Jerusalem to see? The elders. Yeah, and the apostles the and stuff. So yeah. that sounds like they're going back there to see James yeah. and Peter and... James, James, yes, that's yeah, correct. And all, and all, all those this guys is that, had, that uh, it's like they're going back there to correct these people that had been at the feet of Jesus all those years. Yes. Well, not necessarily to correct, to consult with them. Reading on. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles, and the elders, to whom they told all that God had done through them. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, are you starting to get the picture here? So they, these are the ones that came in with Nicodemus and mm -hmm. Joseph of Arimathea. They stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. Is Nicodemus one of those, maybe? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of, what we're saying, uh, quite a number of Pharisees became Christians. But they weren't all ready to, they weren't all ready to sort of leave their Phariseeism behind. They wanted to bring the Phariseeism with them. How can I'm you sure do? I'm sure Jesus was circumcised. What? I'm sure Jesus. Oh, yeah. On the eighth day. have to be. Yeah. I mean, if well, it absolutely. wasn't, there would be a big ruckus about it. Yeah. So what, what did they think when they became Christians? They, okay, now I'm a Christian. And did they a, know and that when they become a Christian, that Pharisee stuff is... No, no, no. Well, you know, they wanted to be... They were, before, they were Pharisees and they were Jews. Now they wanted to be Pharisees and Christians. Well, was, how can you do that? How can was you? being Christian a way of adding more rules to their Pharisee book? Probably. Did they not understand? Why in the world would these people want to be Christians? Oh, it, it looked like it was the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, How can that know, be with all this persecution? Here's a guy. I know I'm a Christian and I'm going to get persecuted. Well, here's a guy who rose from the dead. There's, I mean, who else has done that? Well, this is like... Uh, Moses. This is like the ancient uh, people who served Baal and so forth and... Well, even, you know, it's like these, these ancient people who, any god that came along that seemed like he had a little power, why, well, we'll serve him too. Sure, of course. Why not? You know, it just seems like maybe we're talking about tradition here. Tradition Aren't has they? a lot of power over people. Yeah. If you come up with, with a new thing, religious thing that really makes sense, but it goes off the reservation of what your parents have told you and what their <coughs> parents have told them and everything, they're not going to feel very comfortable with it. Well, did it hurt to be hurt if a Christian became circumcised? Did that hurt anything? Well, th you, you should ask Paul that question. <laughs> well, That's what this yeah, whole book is about. No, see. I think it would. It would hurt. This is what it hurts. It makes it look like you have to do that in order to be saved. Christ is not enough by himself. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, we Jesus need to move kind of on. He addressed that there in, yeah. in John 17, didn't he? Sure. He says the, the eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. Yeah. And he, he, didn't, he didn't add anything else to it. He just no. says... Well, let me give an example. Paul says, I'm your father. Uh, in fact, I, I, I feel like your mother that's given birth to you. And now, ladies, I'm going to turn to you, some of you. I guess some of you are not married yet and don't have children. But how do you react to a, to a newborn child? You forget about the pain that you went through. And you love that child and you say, isn't the child beautiful? And the child may be, the head may be completely distorted and all puffed up and all kinds of stuff because of the whole birth process. Isn't it a beautiful child? Why do mothers say such a thing? 
say, you stand there and say, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen, you know? <laughs> What do we? No, I, I'm, there's I'm, an this is not a joke. I, I'm, I, I, there's an emotional response that sure. just comes. In other words, and, and, and that's our point here, you see. What's happened, the mother has invested nine months of her life into this thing, if you will. I mean, it's not a thing, it's, it's, it's becoming a person now, okay? And she's absolutely committed to this child. You know, she's risked her life for this child. So, what is Paul saying? That's exactly what he's saying. He says, look, you're my, you know, I like, I gave birth to you. I, I can't let people do this to you. I mean, what do parents, what would, what would a mother say or even the father say if, if he thought someone was, was threatening their child with some life-threatening kind of thing? Right. I mean, you would, Protective. oh, absolutely. So I think, I think that's what Paul is trying to, to help us see here. Um, is this Paul's emotional letter? <clears throat> we seem to be getting um, more emotion in this. Well, he's suddenly really gotten into the emotion stuff. It's, okay. it's pretty emotional. There are some yeah. other letters that are somewhat emotional. Okay. Um, he's pretty emotional in Philippians in some spots. Well, it looks like he's covering all his bases here yeah. because he's gone through some really thinkable things. Right. And now he's going to this other mm -hmm. side. Yeah. Could we use the word passionate about those yes. that he loves? Yes, absolutely. And clearly, Paul wants them to become Christ-like. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Do we know any? Do you know any Christians who are really Christ-like? Yes. You're lucky if you do. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful. They're an inspiration. Mm -hmm. So how should Christians appeal to their friends, neighbors, and associates to convince them to become Christians? If, you, if you're working with somebody, let's say, for example, or as a neighbor or something like that, and, and, you, and you want to reach out to that person because you, you like that person and you want them to become a Christian, what should you do? Should you say, okay, you have to take the 20 lessons or let me tell you about the, the logical reasons why you should become a Christian or should you, should you add some emotion in here? You, you have to, the greatest commandment is to love, love okay. one another. Mm -hmm. So a loving, personal appeal goes a long way, doesn't it? I know a lady in her church, she has a, um, what you call ministry. Whenever someone dies, she and her friends will do the potluck for a funeral. And they will even do it for people outside the church if a person wants um, some kind of gathering and wants a church funeral, but they're not a church person. She has gotten person after person after person to come into that loving church because of what she is doing yeah. with this um, funeral potluck, so to s mm -hmm. after the service. The pastor does the service, whether it is a church member or not. Mm -hmm. And that is how they um, show their love in the community. Well, Paul in a number of places in his writings, appeals to his followers to abandon their unchristlike behavior. Um, and a good example is 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Imitate me then just as I imitate Christ. What, what's he suggesting there? That he acts Christ-like. He says, I act Christ-like and I want you to act Christ-like. But here, in, in, look at Galatians 4, verse 12. I beg you, my brothers and sisters, be like me. Not just act like me, be like me. After all, I am like you. Is that, is that, more, is that a deeper commitment than just acting like Christ? Sounds like works to me. Being like me? Sounds like works? Yeah. Whenever you do something, that's a work. I think when you are being, it naturally flows out of you. Uh -huh. that you're changed inside and your being just comes out. Okay. It's like a husband or a wife who adjusts to their spouse, uh -huh. you know, a give and take process because you want to please your husband or your wife. Mm -hmm. And I think in a sense that's how Paul is using that mm -hmm. phrase here. To be like me just means, you know, be willing to have a relationship with Christ mm -hmm. like Him. 
How much, how much change was Paul asking the, the Galatians to really do? Is this a complete paradigm shift? Only the Holy Spirit can do that, I think, in someone's heart. Only the Holy Spirit can do it. Okay. Now, how, how could you measure a change like that? I mean, how could we answer that question that you give? Well, I mean, we have suggested, Jesus suggested, or I shouldn't say we have suggested, Jesus said that if we were truly Christians, people would look at us and praise God. If you walk down the street and you see the kind of peop actions and so forth that's going on in a typical American city in our day, do you praise God? I don't well, think so. In Acts, didn't it talk about that people loved each other so well, so much, mm -hmm. that it impressed the people around them? Mm -hmm. so. so it is different. Being a Christian is different. Well, yeah, though it changes everything about the way you live your life. Yeah. And people behold that. Mm -hmm. By beholding, you become changed. You know, they become curious about your lifestyle. Ultimately, prayer, I've seen, you know, two miracles I can think of. There were totally answers to prayer just recently. I've been praying for friends that they had no idea. Nobody but me and God knew. I was praying for these people, and I'm seeing them change, mm -hmm. you know. And, Amen. and they're Amen. saying that, you know, they have questions toward me because of how I've lived my life before mm -hmm. them. And so I think if you do your best, even though you're faulty, mm -hmm. uh, as long as you continuously go to God and repent of your sins when you know them and mm -hmm. ask Him, you know, to continue to use you to bless mm -hmm. others, He'll do that. Paul uh, actually reached the place where he said, you know, everything else in the world I count as just rubbish. He says, the joy, the love, the freedom, the salvation I found in Jesus Christ means everything to me. And so much so that I'm, I'm ready to die for it. To die for my Christianity. How many of us do you think would be willing to do that? I'm not asking anyone to raise their hands. We probably really don't know until we're put in that yep. position. Well, we believe that difficult times are just ahead for Christians, right? Mm -hmm. The devil's going to come and he's going to make it really difficult. Matthew 24 says, you know, to deceive if possible even the elect. Well, well, I believe that it's already happening. If mm -hmm. There was a story just recently. The city of El Centro has fined a family $300 for having Bible study in their own home. And they say for each additional Bible study that they have in their home, it will be a $500 fine. So we're seeing this because played out already. San Juan Capistrano. In San Juan, there you go. Thank you for the correction. Wow. San Juan Capistrano. And it's also, they've who, also who tried to venture Cucamonga. A few other, they've tried it, but uh, San Juan Capistrano just recently. Mm-hmm. What was the complaint? What was the problem? Oh, they called a religious get-together without a, without a license. Without a, without a permit. Some of the people I know in Rancho, they're pretty touchy about parking on the street. So maybe that was the, the trigger that... Too many cars in their neighborhood. Wow. Better start carpooling. Well, that's what they did in Paul's day. They, it, they got to, well, even after Paul's day, by the time of John's day, they would go, and even in more modern times, Christians have done this. This was, this was true in the com under communism for a long time. They had, they had arranged so that everybody who came, if you're going to meet at somebody's house for, for church, they had arranged that you're going to go that way and I'm going to go this way and it doesn't look like anybody's coming from the same direction. Yeah. Well, Ellen White, who was one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as you know, said these words. What, what do you think of the implications of this? The unstudied, unconscious influence of a holy life is the most convincing sermon that can be given in favor of Christianity. What Argument, you? even when unanswerable, may provoke only opposition, but a godly example has a power that it is impossible wholly to resist. What do you mean by an unstudied, unconscious influence of yeah, a holy life? I was what wondering. Well, I think, I think what that means is people can see that you're not putting on a show. 
this isn't a, this isn't a, some kind of a, a, a charade so that you could try to convince them of something. They can see, they watch you long enough, they can see at your life that, that this is you. This is not something sort of put on the outside. Well, we know that in our day, there's a lot of people who love to talk. I mean, look at the TV shows, <laughs> the radio programs. I mean, just talk, 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 talk. All and now you can do it on the internet and be around the world in an instant. All those preachers yeah. on TV. Well, what about all the reality shows, supposedly reality shows? Some people well, like those. <laughs> Should we take talkers seriously? Politicians, should we take politicians seriously? No. Should, <laughs> should, should we require politicians to sort of public, put their private lives in display so we can see whether their private lives matches their, their, their public profession? They do have influence on many. Mm -hmm. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. And these are Paul's comments to the Corinthians. I am a free man, nobody's slave, but I make myself everybody's slave in order to win as many people as possible. Okay, I'm a free man, I make myself like a slave so that I can win as many people as possible. While working with the Jews, I live like a Jew in order to win them. And even though I myself am not subject to the law of Moses, I live as though I were when working with those who are in order to win them. In the same way, when working with Gentiles, I live like a Gentile. You can see partly why the Jews don't, I mean, the, the Jews have never become Christians, don't like Paul's words here. I live like a Gentile outside the Jewish law in order to win Gentiles. This does not mean that I don't obey God's law. I'm really under Christ's law. Among the weak, in faith, I find I become weak like one of them in order to win them. So I become all things to all people that I may save some of them by whatever means are possible. Doesn't that come across as being somewhat hypocritical? Manipulative? You're one thing in front of one group of people and you're a different thing in front of another group of people. Well, but how do you influence people? I mean, if you, if you really want to get them to become a Christian. Is this just Paul's way of saying that I am friends with everybody? I'm friends with the Gentiles. I'm extent, friend yeah. with... Yeah. And he's saying that I try to be friends and partake of their lifestyle and don't criticize it and, and just become one of them. Remembering, of course, that in his younger days he wouldn't have had anything to do with these people. Mm -hmm. so Anywhere that, near them. Does that mean when he's with his Jewish friends he, he eats matzo balls, but when he's with his Gentile friends he, he'll eat pork? <laughs> well, I, mean, I don't think I don't he went that so. far. And what? <laughs> I think it has to do with godly it. wisdom. <laughs> You know, we encounter various individuals throughout our day, mm -hmm. and I pray for godly wisdom that I'll have, you know, the wherewithal that God will impart His wisdom to me to know how to deal with this particular individual with this lifestyle in order to save them to God. No. You know, I, I think it has to do with godly wisdom and dealing with, you know, a so variation what, what of would personalities. Paul say if, I, if a group came up to. Hey, Paul, you seem like a nice guy. Hey, we're having a poker game tonight. Mm -hmm. Come on over. You think he would come? Or what about when he's, when well. he's, in, when he's in Jerusalem with, the, with uh, his Jewish friends there? Mm -hmm. They're still going to the temple mm -hmm. and doing morning and evening sacrifices. So does he go with his Jewish friends to do that? He made the mistake of doing that and it cost him his life. You know, I like what Andrew said because I've dealt with a lot of people and if you're kind of at a loss, you say, God, you know this person, how I should act or, or what this person needs to hear, you know, in this situation. And doesn't it happen that you get an answer and, and you know how better to deal with a person by praying to God about the person? Mm -hmm. Just instant prayer, yeah. instant. Mm -hmm. I, at the risk of uh, maybe offending some, I'm going to tell you a personal story very briefly. I one time was in school in a, in a Johns Hopkins University 
and one of the professors in, wanted to invite all the students in his class, or, or in a, it was actually a lab group, over to his house on a Saturday night. The, the, the quarter had ended and was just ending and wanted to get a little better acquainted. And so he, he invited us all to a cocktail party. I said, no, I, I, you know, I don't drink alcohol. He said, don't, don't worry about that. He says, there'll be soft drinks and there'll be other things there. Just come over and, and mix. So should I have gone to that cocktail party? Would Jesus have gone? I mean, that's the question. They, didn't they accuse him of going of Drink, partying around what, and exactly. being a drunkard? And a well, I'll tell you whatever. what happened. Without, I don't have time to go through the whole story. I went. I, w my wife and I went to this cocktail party. We were the, only there a few minutes, and a lady just popped. A lady I'd never seen before in my life popped up with a question about Christianity and about what I believe and so forth like this. We spent the whole rest of the evening talking about the Bible. And she became an Adventist mm -hmm. as a result That's of that excellent. conversation mm -hmm. because I went to a cocktail party. Now, you let me tell you. didn't have to imbibe. No, we didn't, I mean, we didn't drink any alcohol. With other people without having to drink the same stuff they do. No. Well, let me give you another example. I have a close friend who has spent much of his life ministering to Muslims. And he suggested, and I think rightly so, that, you know, in, in most Muslim countries today, g following the, because they're dominated by Islam, they believe that if a person leaves Islam and becomes a Christian, they have to be thrown out of their family, they have to change their name, everything. They have to be, a, you know, Christians are completely different. They must have anything to do between Christians and Islam. And I know uh, for a fact that Christian churches in the Middle East in the past have had signs up over them, no Muslim admitted here. Wow. Yeah. Um, but my friend said, you know, is there anything wrong with wearing a, a long white Muslim robe? Is there anything wrong with having a, a Muslim name? That's, that's not a sin in having a Muslim name. And he started a movement uh, in which people, you know, became, as it were, Christians without leaving the, the sort of Islamic traditions that they had grown up with other than the fact that their, their faith moved over to become Christ-like. And whereas in the past our churches had very, very difficult times making any converts at all in some of those countries, this group has grown quite vigorously. Now, is, is, that, is that all right? Well, they, get, they don't have to dress differently. No. And, and the way you dress does not well, get more, you to heaven or not to heaven. Yeah. More than that, if they decide to become a Christian, they can still witness to their friends and their family. They don't, they don't get thrown out. So, did, so the family will not throw them out if they become a Christian and don't take up the Christian well, ways? And again, that's an argument. Some of our, our Middle Eastern friends would say, you're not really a Christian unless you separate yourself completely from Islam. And you've got to take a Christian name and you have to behave differently. So those people would say no. So some Islamists, the idea that if you're a Christian, you'd eat pork and, and drink alcohol. Yeah. Right. And, and that's, you don't that's, have to do that. Adventists have had a little trouble in the past. In, in, in some, I shouldn't say trouble. They were, the Muslims weren't quite sure what to do with them because their, their definition of a Christian is someone who eats pork and worships <laughs> on Sunday or, or, or and alcohol, pork and alcohol. Yeah. And, and Adventists didn't do any of those things. What about Nicodemus, yeah. who came to Jesus in the nighttime because mm -hmm. he was afraid of uh, what his peers would think of him? Yeah. So, obviously, he worshipped the Jesus, but mm -hmm. still held on to whatever it was he was hanging on to in order not to offend his peers. Mm -hmm. Well, in the early days of Christian missionaries, going to Africa and India and China and places like that, it was almost as if to become a Christian, you had to become a Western European. You had to dress like a Western European. You had to behave like. And I know some places in Africa. I spent many years in Africa, where they, you know, everybody wears their native clothes basically. Except if you're going to get up and preach on Sabbath, you're supposed to wear a suit and a tie. But there's nothing about suit and a tie that makes it sacred. 
You well, know? isn't that the same as requiring circumcision? It's some kind of outwardly Possibly. works? Possibly. You have, have to be careful. You don't want to mm -hmm. tear down people's religion, but think about it. Mm -hmm. Very well, positive. Well, it's easy to talk about because we're not in this situation. Mm -hmm. It would be very, it would be different being in this situation. So here's the challenge for us in our day, and the challenge for these people we've been talking about. Can you clearly separate between what are cultural ideas and, let's say, maybe even your religious prejudices, if you will, and the core beliefs of the gospel? So that if we go to another group or another culture, we can say, please accept these core ideas of Christianity. Uh, you don't have to be like me in terms of my culture, my language, my, but accept these core principles of the gospel. Can we clearly differentiate? It it's probably depends on the culture. I mean, they all fit differently. What, what I, if you're talking about being all things to all people, is, is he doing that to get in? And then depositing these core beliefs? Mm -hmm. Is that what he's doing? Is that what you're going towards? Well, our, our, what do you think Paul did? Our, our, what do you mean by core beliefs? What, what does it take to become a Christian? That, that's the question. You know, what, what are, do you have to wear a suit and a tie? No. Well, I don't, do you have to really understand uh, uh, the larger view? Do you have to understand, you know? The sanctuary. Right. Doctrine. But people somehow, they, they see this, this man, this, mm -hmm. they see Jesus and the Holy Spirit or something, they don't know all of that stuff. They don't probably have a clear understanding of the Trinity and all of these other things, but, but they want to be, something attracts them here mm -hmm. and, and they want to be like him or with him or affiliated with him. So, well, you know, big the, deal about all these core beliefs. The uh, <laughs> doctrines, you start with a few and you mature and you learn mm -hmm. about the sanctuary and all this. But when you mature, you don't necessarily put on a tie or a suit. So that there's spiritual maturity, and but you don't have to go into cultural and maturity or question. tradition, but you would have to think very hard, what do I believe is tradition and culture and what is the, the foundation that is needed for other people? Exactly. Can, can, someone, can someone behold me and see Christ in me and be, want to become a Christian? And and but not want to become a Seventh Day Adventist. Mm -hmm. Can they still be a Christian? Can they still follow the Master I as best as they so. understood? And just because they don't want to become a Seventh Day Adventist, I have some friends who are doing just that. They, <clears throat> I've done a short Bible study with them. They, they, they're the same friends I was praying about uh, for a while. They became vegetarian without letting on to anybody that they became vegetarian. They told me, because they, they know I'm vegetarian, and they, they felt I was somebody they could trust. Uh, so they told me that, you know, Andrea, don't tell anybody, but we've been vegetarian for three going on four months. And we feel great, but don't tell anybody. And um, one night before I went over to their home, I prayed, God, if you've got something for me to uh, teach to these, People, you know, I, I never like to go over to somebody's house without witnessing for them or to them, you know, and, and talking about God. So I always ask God to be present with me as I gather with my friends. And if there's anything you'd like for me to share with them, then let them be the one to open up the conversation, not me. And that's exactly what happened. My friend just looked at me point blank at dinner and he said, what about the Sabbath day? Mm -hmm. So I tell him, don't let me answer you with my own words. Let, let's go to the Bible. And I carry my Bible with me. So I went to various verses that I'd highlighted. I'm not fortunate enough yet to say I put them to memory. But um, I went to all the highlighted portions of my Bible. And they were convinced. 
-hmm. And my friend since then, it's been a couple months, she came to me and said, everything, Andrea, that you've talked to us about, we believe. And, and we love your church and we love the teachings of your church and everything, but we can never convert because of our parents and our, mm -hmm. our siblings and, you know, so there's that social, cultural part of their life that they're not willing to give up even though yeah. they're seeing we, the truth. Uh, I once belonged to a church, well, it was the time I was attending Johns Hopkins University, belonged to a church that was just exploding with growth. It was so exciting, all the stuff going, stuff going on all week long at the church and people were involved and all that kind of stuff. And uh, right nearby was, a, was another church, a Protestant church, and the pastor of that church died. And somehow or other, his, his wife found out about what was going on in our church. And every Sabbath, she, she, she didn't drive, so she would ask us to go to her house, pick her up, and take her to our church. She said, I, I, I don't want to become an Adventist, but I just love to go to your church. I, uh, this is just me speaking here, but sometimes I have thought that we have a tendency in our relationships to a proselytizing others, we're, we're concerned about turning them into Adventists mm -hmm. rather than, than having them meet the Master. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be a mistake, I hope. So are we, are we hitting on some core beliefs here? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Which is um, w whatever comes up, we talk yeah. about. Well, um, yeah, that may be the appropriate thing to do when you're with friends. What did Paul tell the Philippian jailer in Acts 31, Acts 16, 31? Mm -hmm. He said, only believe. Mm -hmm. Lord. And, and, they, and, you know, they, they were baptized. He and his whole family were baptized within a few hours. How many of the core beliefs did they have? Yeah. We might catch this again next week, but I was looking ahead here. Uh, chapter 5, verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. I mean, that's, you can't get it any. So, let, let's, yeah, absolutely. Well, so, in, in I'm watching the clock tickle down here. Um, in our world, there's a great, talk, a great deal of talk about compromise. Now, often it's in the context of politics, and we seem to have a problem with compromising in politics these days. What about Christianity? Are any of our Christian standards being compromised? Well, that's the problem with with um, compromise. It, some things you can't compromise with. Why not? Because when you have a compromise, you you find out that there's something in common. You may not agree how to get there, so you compromise how to get there, so you can go to it together. But What's if you don't have, well, if you don't have anything agreed on, if you've got the devil on one side, you got Christ on the other. How are you going to compromise between those two? You know, and there's, there's other things like that, too. We compromise all the time in our relationships, in our day-to-day -day activities, in our thoughts. We, we believe there's going to be a time, hopefully not too far in the distant future, or not too far in the future, period, in which the devil's going to come, He's going to make all sorts of accusations. But there's going to be at least a core group of people who will stand up and stand tall and stand for the truth though the heavens fall. And they're going to, and, and, you know, what are they going to stand for? What is it that the, you know, I had a professor one time that said, which Christian doctrines that you believe would you be willing to die for? It's one way of putting it. Ultimately, God's character, which is His law. Mm -hmm. And His law is love. Yeah. It's kind of hard to know what the situation is where yeah. you're going to make that decision. But um, there are things about God that are very important to me. Mm -hmm. and that's all I can say right now. They're very important to me. How far it'll be can only be tested. Are our lives being transformed on a day by day, maybe even hour by hour, or week by week, month by month basis to become more like Jesus Christ? That would be the question. Well, how about two steps forward and one step back? Two steps forward Sometimes and one step Sometimes that works too. 
well, part of that is that you have to find out more and more what Christ is. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of it too. I mean, just to say, I want to be by Christ, and then you don't know who he is, mm -hmm. you know, you can only get up to some point. So, Paul talks a little bit about, in, in the verses here, let's look, for example, Galatians 4.13. You remember why I preached the gospel to you the first time. It was because I was ill. But even though my physical condition was a great trial to you. Now, remember in those days, there were a lot of people who actually believed that an illness was a curse from God. But no, he says, even though I was ill, um, even though my physical condition was a great trial to you, you did not despise or reject me. Instead, you received me as you would an angel from heaven. You received me as you would Christ Jesus. You were so happy. What has happened? I myself can say that you would have taken out your own eyes if you could and given them to me. And, and some people use this as one of their key verses to suggest that the thorn in the flesh that he talks about in 2 Corinthians 7, uh, 12, 7 to 9 had something to do with poor vision. Because elsewhere he says, see with what large letters I write and so forth. So it's quite possible, maybe after the Damascus Road experience, we don't know, but possibly after the Damascus Road experience, that, ta that Paul's eyesight wasn't so good. And I'm sure that the, uh, the, the lens situation was a little different than it is today. Uh, most of, a lot of us are wearing glasses here. Um, so at one time, Paul was really esteemed by them, thought of as a friend, a leader, and now they are viewing him as an enemy. Mm -hmm because of these other people that came in. And he's frustrated. Mm -hmm. Well, instead of Paul's, re, uh, but instead of rejecting Paul and his message, the Galatians apparently had taken him in, cared for him, and loved him even more because of his affliction. Why does God allow Christians to suffer? Everybody's. Couldn't he, couldn't he stop it? Yeah. Well, he will. Eventually. He could have. He could have. What would happen in our world if all the Christians were happy and healthy and all the other people were terrible shape and they, you know, they could, you know, just looked ill. They were all the ones who got sick all the time and so forth. And everybody could clearly see that. Everybody would become a Christian. <laughs> just so <laughs> they could get that healing. Yeah, exactly. They would do the right thing for the wrong reason. Right. Oh dear me. All right. Well, <laughs> d does illness ever prove to be a blessing? Yes. Mm -hmm. When? I can think of a particular time. A young. Let, let me let me think. Let me let me mention a huge example. The HIV/AIDS epidemic has been looked upon by a lot of people as as a curse from the devil. But I can tell you there's a lot of people in Africa suffering from this epidemic who now are taking Christianity very seriously because they're facing a life and death situation. And the, the churches in Africa have just exploded. Well, but isn't that, isn't that saying what Gordon said here? Well, they're, they're adopting Christianity doing the right thing for the wrong reason. No, I, I'm asking, I'm asking you. I mean, is, are you, would you say that, no, if, if you have AIDS, you, you're not allowed to, uh, to become a Christian? Why aren't they, are they embracing Islam as well? Why would they embrace Christianity over Islam? Isn't it a blessing that they're given enough time to think of eternity, to get themselves oriented, and to have time to think about it and become Christians before... Uh the inevitable happens, because they're in, they're in a uh, dead-end situation. That happens here, too. Yeah. I mean, why does it have to come to the point where we suffer and we're at a really f terminal stage if we're suffering and we have a condition? And why, why is it then that many people come to Christ or they want to ask for forgiveness from family members that they haven't talked to in years? and? Imagine how Christ feels. Why does it have to come to that for us to be driven closer to Him? Yeah. I, in answer to your question, my, my response would be, if you travel through Africa, you will discover that in many countries in Africa, half or more of the hospitals 
are run by Christian organizations. Mm -hmm. That's not true of Islam. They may have a clinic in one of the big cities or something like that. Mm -hmm. They have not. So if, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna look for schools, if you're gonna look for hospitals, it's the Christians who've been doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you feel about these emotional appeals from Paul? Do they touch you? Not without the logic that he put in before. Okay, so you think the logic needs to come along with it? Mm -hmm. I think there's there's people that that weigh more on the emotional side, but they still have the logical mm -hmm. side. And there's other people that are purely logical and have a little bit of emotion. So mm -hmm. I think I think it can go either way depending on who you are. Well, how do you suppose the Galatians first responded to this letter? Let's just, let's just imagine now that there's, let's say there's, instead of one church, which probably wouldn't have been possible in, in Paul's day, that there were several house groups that met. And let's say the letter, this letter to the Galatians arrived and you're, you get it the first time. So you stand up on Sabbath and you just read the letter straight through. And those church members who were there on that occasion, <coughs> before the letter gets a chance to get to their house church and to be read in their house church, these Christians over here who heard it are saying to the other church, boy, we got this letter from Paul. What, what do you think they would say about the letter? What do you think there was their initial response to uh, reading of this letter? If there was a familiarity with the letter and it recalled in their memories uh, the good times with Paul. Um, he spoke pretty, pretty straight then in this letter, um, you foolish Galatians and so forth. Well, you know, but he may have said that, spoke that way when he was <laughs> with them the first time, you know. I think they might have been surprised that Paul even thought of them as the enemy. Maybe they hadn't realized how far they had moved from yeah. Paul's thinking. Is it difficult to speak the truth? Nope. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even it almost, almost has a, a negative connotation in our day, doesn't it? Even in love, yeah. it's difficult. Mm -hmm. People lose their jobs, their yeah. families over it. Ellen White once uh, penned these words, which I think are very, very significant. I mean, she says so many things so well. This is Desire of Ages, page 353, paragraph 1. Speaking about Jesus, of course, he did not censure human weakness. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity. But tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. Did he, was he rebuking? He was rebuking, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And he was being very clear about it, right? He was, he was telling it like it is, right? Mm -hmm. But there were tears in his voice. What, what would that sound like? Pleading. Well, he wept over Jerusalem, the city he loved. They refused to receive him, the way, the truth, and the life. They rejected him, the Savior. But he regarded them with pitying tenderness and sorrow so deep that it broke his heart. Every soul was precious in his eyes. While he always bore himself with divine dignity, he bowed with tenderest regard to every member of the family of God and all men and that of course would include women too, he saw fallen souls whom it was his mission to save. Well, he says he chastens the child that he loves, mm -hmm. but if you have not been chastened by the Lord or rebuked by him in some way, then you well, are Paul illegitimate, thought, basically. Yeah, exactly. That's what Paul yeah. says. If, if God isn't disciplining you, then you're probably an illegitimate child. Right. Well, some people seem to have the ability to speak the truth in love. How good are we at that? It's tough, isn't it? I think you can speak the truth in love, but the hearer doesn't want to hear it. Yeah. I mean, you could be as gentle as possible, but if they're, they don't want to hear something. Well, how should we react if we see truth, I mean, sorry, if we see error creeping into the church? Do we need to speak up? Yes. Definitely. 
or should we just be spectators? And here's a real huge question for our young people. Is it easier to live a Christian life, let's say in a secular university where you know that your, your lifestyle is completely separate and different from most, almost everybody around you? Is it easier to live a Christian life in that environment where, where you, you clearly don't, I mean, people know that you're different than it is in a Christian institution where everybody is supposed to be like you, but you see people sort of creeping into worldly standards, and they think that you should creep with them. Well, you know, I've never been in a Christian educational institution, mm -hmm. and I think it's very difficult to hold on to your Christianity in a secular. Now, I know, and some of the wild kids came from the Christian schools, so, but I think it's hard either way. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a very hot topic I that I'm going to suggest, but uh, for instance, the music mm -hmm. in our church, um, the drums and the guitar, um, you know, I like the conservative traditional hymns. Um, I brought a friend to church who said himself, he's not a Seventh-day Adventist, said himself, I can't tell the difference between the worldly clubs, nightclubs that I attend, and the church services that you brought me to. Mm -hmm. Had it not been for the lyrics, mm -hmm. if you can hear the lyrics and make yeah. out what they're, what's being said, I can't tell a difference between the music at the nightclubs and the church. And that's a real hot topic, and I see that creeping into our church. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, do you think Paul was successful in his appeal to the Galatians? We don't have the answer to that, do we? Mm. Which part of his appeal do you think was more successful? The logical, carefully thought through theological stuff or this emotional stuff? It may have depended on the type of person you are. If you're a yeah. logical person, that part would have appealed. If you're an emotional, perhaps it was that part. Yeah. Well, we're running out of time. Which do you think would better prepare you for the end times? A religion based on emotional appeals or a religion based on carefully thought through logical arguments. We'll leave that question with you. It's something for you to think of in this next week. We'll see you then.